Eric, this is a uh, it's a powerful episode, and we're going to challenge the a basic statement that for a lot of people, it's like, hey, look, I get it. I used to be a young whippersnapper myself. You see someone else. You see them outlifting you. You think to yourself, yeah, but I'm better than you. I should be lifting more than you, and that doesn't make me feel good because you're stronger than me, and it challenges my place in society, how I feel about myself. I'm feeling very fragile. I'm actually feeling pretty insecure right now. So what's the uh, best solution for that, Eric? What, what, what would I do if I feel that I'm being displaced, emasculated, uh, because someone else is doing better than me? You got two doors here, okay? Yeah. And I'm going to let you decide which one you want to open. Uh, you, you could even view this as the meme of the guy sweating about to push one or two buttons. Yeah. One is reevaluate the association you have of lifting weights okay. to your masculinity and whether or not masculinity is something that you should be valuing as a human characteristic in the first place. And maybe just think more deeply about who you want to be as a human. Sounds tough. That's one door. Sounds tough. It, it is. It is. I, th I think you know which door you're going to go through. It's anything but that. The second door is make a fake account. Or if you're feeling bold, Decent. don't make a fake account. Yeah. And just try to tear that person down to where oh, their yeah. accomplishment pales in comparison to the vitriol and hate uh, that, that you put out there. So it's essentially using human beings as ladders to pull yourself up by pulling them yeah. down. Yeah. And really, it's about equality when you think yeah. about it. They're above you. Pull them down. Everyone's the same. Everyone's a corpse. That's Two sound, doors. It, it sounds kind of beautiful yes. to me because he, here's the thing. You think you're better than me. Well, newsflash, you aren't. Um, and I, I, I just think it's funny that, uh, you know, some people will say that, yeah, I'm getting upset. Okay. So I, I'm the one that's being out of line trying to impose my worldview on you when it has nothing to do with you. And I just want to say, we got the pyramids. Okay, like that's, that's right. Okay, we it's it's historic. There's a historical legacy. I mean, there there's a reason why Napoleon. What what do you say? Manifest destiny. It, it's not that's not just a phrase that he made up in order to justify the actions that he did. That was real, Eric. Manifest well, just destiny. Like, uh, well, there's Mr. Bonaparte. I'm yeah. going apart <laughs> all, all from that uh, <laughs> that line of of discussion. Uh, and I think I'm going to pivot to saying, hey, historical context, who do we have on for the oh. third time, Omar? None other than the strength historian himself, living it up in Austin, mm -hmm. uh, you know, actually not leaving his home, so not really living it up because of COVID, but in the great city where uh, the, the mecca of, of the iron is, the Stark Center, uh, he's, he's live, actually not live because this is live, but this is not live, this is on Monday days after we recorded it, he is on Iron Culture 3 Pete to talk about the history of women's bodybuilding. And we thought it would be cool uh, to not just have a historical perspective, but also to juxtapose it to some of the experiences of women in strength sport and the Iron Game in general today. So we have returning guests, Natalie Hansen, world champ, returning guest, Jessica Bittner, always pronounced her name right, mm -hmm. never wrong. True. Don't just, just, just don't even question it. It is true. So we've got some 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 champion level <laughs> lifters on to talk about their experiences and also the historical context from the strength historian himself. A bit of juxtaposition between physique sport and the Iron Game and some of the roots of why uh, it has been a different experience depending on what angle you take into the Iron as a woman and what the role of women has been uh, and has been been pushed to try to become. Uh, so that it could achieve some parity with the uh, options we enjoy as men. So uh, this is a really good episode. I enjoyed it. I learned some things. It uh, helped me look internally, think about my perspectives. And Omar, I know what door I chose. Uh, and what door are you going to choose out of those two that we talked about? Yeah, so I mean, I think I already stated mine. But if you want me to double mm -hmm. down on that, because as we know, if you... Double pull down. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you, if you show any... Um, change of opinion let's say maybe you've evolved or you've reconsidered your stance that's just being hypocritical so i'm double i'm actually tripling down so ask me one more time i'm i'm tripling down well it's it's good to see because uh I'm consistent as soon as you chose the like door that i thought you were yeah exactly <laughs> the best food really uh but it's good to see you're not a flip-flopper like, omar so mm -hmm. we're both walking through the same door I don't confidently them, together yeah that's right <laughs> the only door that matters which is at the top of that pyramid Ooh. um alone while while the earth lays before us in mm. triumph mm. um, alone a, is the emphasis there. 
<laughs> such a good i will say such a good episode i i really immensely enjoy episodes like this because for ourselves included where it challenges uh, some of the assumptions it's an opportunity also uh to learn uh to uh educate yourself and also to participate uh within other segments where we were kind of talking about this eric we're in our own little uh space we're in our own little bubble we got the iron cult uh listeners and one of the core themes of iron culture and we look at the arrow of time what does it say underneath? If you've ever seen the, if someone's like, oh, I can't believe we're talking about this, read the sub headline. It says, for all lifters. <laughs> like, I think mm -hmm. if that doesn't describe us, I don't know what does. So I think it's a fantastic episode, and I'm just glad we're able to have them on and, uh, you know, very thankful to our guests. 100%. History, science, culture. Uh, this has got at least two of those, if, if not a little bit of science. I think I mentioned. Uh, the hist the uh, the scientific fact of, of why whirlpools are created. So li listen in close for that little bit of science to hit all three. But like like Omar said, for all lifters, and uh, since Omar and I are are not all lifters, and we don't have that uh, ability to have that experience, we got to bring people on, and we couldn't have been more happy to have these guests. So sit back, enjoy this episode, folks. It's your favorite damn podcast, Lamer by Scientology. Back again with some returning champions. We got, so, Eric, let me preface this. Mm. Of course, mm. we got Nally Hansen. Whew, strong. Connor Heffernan. That's a three-peat for both of them appearing today. And these are the great trilogies, okay? So, we got, what, Lord of the Rings. We got The Matrix. We got Dario Argento. We got the Coker trilogy, if we want to talk international uh, cinema. The Three Colors, okay? There's a lot of different trilogies. And then we also have... JB, Jessica Bittner, which once again, we want to publicly, so there's a lot of controversies here. We're, we have Connor on as part of our contractual obligation that once again, we did not deny the 19, uh, 1848 potato famine. That is not a thing. That is not us. That's not how we represent ourselves. We also never said, for the record, we've always said Jessica's name, perfect. We, we never said Bootner. No one ever, ever, ever even tried to say Bootner on this podcast. So this isn't a, an apologist episode. This is just a, a powerhouse Connor was saying before, those uh, that can't uh, teach, we say around here, those that aren't world champions or aesthetic or anything, host podcasts. So that's what we're doing here. We want to update all of you, actually. There's been numerous improvements on here. We fired our previous uh, hosts. And also, we won our litigation against all other pyramids. So now, Eric Helms is the sole owner of all the pyramids in the world. So that's just us. So if you notice... Eric, of course, was wearing his little like astronaut suit, looking real cute. Uh, I was gliding up there. If you're on the video, if on the audio, just just picture an epic scene. That's us. I hope everyone's well. Welcome to 2021. Yeah, happy New Year, folks! And uh, sitting atop our galactic pyramidal empire, uh, we're we're honored to have two three Pete's and and a one two Pete, um, and none of them are named Pete. So it's it's going to get only less confusing from there. So uh, first off. We're going to talk about bodybuilding, we're going to talk about strength sport, we're going to talk about history, and we're going to talk about the changing landscape uh, of all of this together, and we've got an awesome lineup for it. So, what we're going to be talking about, I want to talk about the women's bodybuilding division, uh, and, and to do that, we have professional women's bodybuilder Connor Heffernan on. Um, no, <laughs> you like how I stole your off-air joke to use on-air to pump myself no, no, up? You, you did it much better. Don't worry. Okay, I'll take it. Thank you. Um, no, but in all seriousness, uh, I would I would love to hear what you proposed to me after uh, I think the first time you were on to get a historical understanding of women in bodybuilding, the women's bodybuilding division, and how that's changed because we've seen that division not only the division itself change. Uh, over time, but also new divisions crop up, and the division fade a little bit, get reformed, come back. So it's been a, a, a tumultuous division, if you will, and even just, you know, participation of women in bodybuilding has, has changed a lot. So I would, I would love to hear, if you don't mind, at a high level, if you could give us that story. That story. Uh, yeah, so first, thanks so much for having me back, even though I have noticed there's a correlation between my presence and potato famine jokes. So as an Irish historian, being linked to famine denial isn't really a good look for my career, but that's fine. We'll just, you know, we'll run with it and we'll see how it goes. Price of admission, my friend. I mean, if it's in potatoes, that's probably the one thing I can afford. Um, <laughs> see, now I'm getting involved and that's not, mm -mm. that's not good. This is not a good look for me. So 
the history of women's bodybuilding quickly and how it evolved, I suppose the first thing to say is obviously the timelines between men's and women's bodybuilding are slightly different in the same way that men's and women's powerlifting is different and similarly with men's and women's weightlifting. But they're not as different as maybe some people would think. And also there's some really interesting parallels between women's bodybuilding or women's physique competitions and then the development of men's bodybuilding. So the first major men's bodybuilding contest, 1901, Eugene Sandow, the best developed man in Great Britain and Ireland. It takes three years to get everyone involved. He's looking at photographs of men. He's holding regional competitions. There's about a thousand entrants whittled down to one individual, W.M. Murray. So that's 1901. 1902, Sandow tries to host another physique show, but this time only for women. Now he says, if women submit a photograph of themselves to my magazine, I will whittle down all the photograph submissions and then we'll host a competition. Just let that sink in for a minute. Man you don't know asking for photos of you in a bikini so he can judge them. It's really like 2021 on Instagram. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, no women submit a photo to Sandez magazine. And one woman actually writes him and says, what the hell are you smoking? Why would I submit a photograph to your magazine? So Sandow's, you know, nefarious, slightly perverted efforts are foiled. He'll have to get his kicks another way. In the United States, in the early 1900s, Bernard McFadden, equally strange and eccentric, but he has a better line on speaking to women. So he says, I'm going to host a physical culture exhibition. So in 1903 and then again, 1904, he hosts this grand extravaganza. There's weightlifting, wrestling, fencing, a load of other activities. And there's also a men's physique competition and a women's physique competition. He splits the prize money down the middle, $250 for the men, $250 for the women. So it's a really egalitarian event. There's a male winner, uh, Al Trelor. There's a female win winner, Emma Newkirk slash Miss Marshall. And you can actually look at videos of Al Trelor and Emma Newkirk posing online on YouTube. What you will notice is Al Trelor is hitting front double biceps, back double biceps, most muscular. Emma Newkirk is wearing like a morph suit from like her neck down. It's all white and she's not flexing a single muscle. So it's a physique competition with the kind of caveat that women shouldn't really be muscular in it. So he's more interested in slim body, the Venus de Milo style stature. And he says that the ultimate prize for Emma Newkirk is she was married soon after the competition. And that's really what women's bodybuilding slash physique shows were all about in the early 1900s. And I can see both of the guests taking deep breaths in. It doesn't really get better until the 1980s. But the interesting thing about McFadden's show is the next year he tries to run it again. The anti-morality or the morality police in New York, Anthony Comstock says, women in morph suits from the neck down, that is pornographic. So he tries to have McFadden arrested. There's a huge court case because he's smearing pornography around the streets of New York. They didn't have the internet back then, I guess, so maybe it was pornographic in some people's eyes. But the court case is thrown out. But after the second physique show, McFadden says, this isn't really worth the hassle. So he doesn't host another men's competition until the 1920s, and he doesn't host another women's competition. In the 1920s, there is a huge development in both men's and women's bodybuilding, though, because we have the birth of the Miss America competition. The Miss America competition in 1921, you know, personality round, bikini round, I would fail all of these rounds. It normalizes the practice of women in bikinis in public. Because oh. prior to this time, if you wanted to swim as a woman in the United States, you're basically wearing a morph suit, you know, from the neck down. So the Miss America competition normalizes the practice of women in bikinis, but it also influences the development of the Mr. America competition in 1939. John Fair has written about the fact that when they wanted to do a men's bodybuilding competition, they looked at the format of the Miss America and said, we're too lazy to think of something better. Let's do a personality round. Let's do a physique round. Let's do a weightlifting round instead of a talent or skill. So the Miss America show is really important for women's physique contests, but also men's physique contests. But from the Miss America to really the 1970s, there's effectively nothing. For want of a better phrase, Women's bodybuilding in that period between Miss America to the 1970s is reduced to once-off bikini rounds at men's bodybuilding shows, which is effectively kind of taking that one segment 
from the Miss America contest, the bikini round, putting them around the hall and then voting on a winner. It's not voting on muscularity. It's not voting really on aesthetics. It's just something that very perverted bodybuilding organizers know will bring men through the doors. Now, what changes and where the actual origins and birth birth is of women's bodybuilding is found in the 1970s. And it's fueled by, I, I can curse on this, right? Because I've been lecturing mm-hmm. all day. So I've, mm-hmm. like, okay, it's fueled by fuck you energy. And this is the most powerful motivation known to men and women around the world, because this is the rise of third wave feminism. Women are starting to push back and challenge against kind of male only sports. So women's bodybuilding is fueled in the 1970s by fuck you energy. So we have an individual in a YMCA in Scranton, I believe, Henry McGee, who has his own women's bodybuilding show. Now, this is seen as the first bodybuilding contest in the mid 1970s. Again, they're not really emphasizing muscularity. They're not really letting women pose. They're wearing high heels and just walking out onto the stage. It's kind of a disaster from an organizational point of view, but it's so good, but also so bad that some of the women who compete say, I could do better than that. And they start to host their own competitions in the late 1970s. So from 1977 to 1980, the sport of women's bodybuilding is effectively born. And it actually coincides really well with the the birth of women's powerlifting because we get the Superior Physique Association being created in the 1970s. We get offshoots all around the East and West Coast. We get some women who are married to elite male bodybuilders becoming part of the organization, like Christian Zane, who is married, obviously, to Frank Zane, becomes the head of the Joe Weider uh, Women's Bodybuilding Association. So we get this brief period in the late 1970s where it's kind of a free-for-all, where there's you know maybe a dozen different competitions. And then Joe Weider and a few others like the um, the NCA, pardon me, come together and they say, well, we're going to have our own competitions. Joe Weider kind of beats everyone out and creates the Miss Olympia competition in 1980. So I've talked for far too long. Um, and I know from my students that they don't like listen to me after five minutes. So maybe I'll put a, put a pause on it there. So we have this long history, but then this explosion in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and it's fueled by fuck you energy. And from the 1980s, we then start to see changes and morph, morphing in the kinds of bodies that are permissible on a bodybuilding stage. So I guess my question to you is, how much do you think uh, it's a chicken or egg scenario here where the push to have women's physique competitions is expanding the, the normalization of, of what could be acceptable? Um, to be a woman's body to look like to the broad society, or at least to the, the lifting society? Or how much do you think the physique competitions are waiting for some level of acceptance in society to then go, maybe we could try this now? Or is it maybe a little bit of both? So I think there's two things going on at play. From the 1930s, women's weightlifting is becoming more permissible in the lifting community. We have Pudgy Stockton, um, who's very well known, she has an article in Bob Hoff, or a series in Bob Hoffman's Strength and Health magazine called The Barbells, which is kind of insulting, but actually really funny, like B-A-R-B-E-L-L-E-S. Like, he's an asshole towards women, but it's also very funny. Um, so Bob Hoffman's Strength and Health magazine is great because it has a dedicated weightlifting column for women. A lot of female powerlifters and bodybuilders will talk about the fact that Pudgy gave them inspiration, that they went to Pudgy's articles um, for information. So in the lifting community, there is this slow kind of precipice that we're going towards, where it's more and more acceptable for women to lift weights. But in the broader society, there is like the issue, quote unquote, of female muscularity. And this isn't something that is really at all negotiated. And we're still dealing with the ramifications of that in 2021. So those early physique competitions, you know, we get comments of women not wanting to look too masculine or too, too manly, for want of a better phrase. As early as 1985, we have someone like Bev Francis, amazing powerlifter who moves into bodybuilding. And she's placing very low down in bodybuilding competitions for women because she's seen to have an overly masculine physique. So I'd say in the broader society, female sporting participation is more, if not accepted, it's becoming more the norm. But in bodybuilding and then in powerlifting to a certain extent, there is a real disease or uncomfortableness with female muscularity past a certain point. 
And in women's bodybuilding, within the space of about eight years, it goes from, you know, the weeders and Miss Olympia saying, well, this is great, this is fantastic, more women entering the physique game, to we need to set in place a standard so they don't become too masculine or too manly. So although women's lifting is becoming more accepted, muscularity is still this very um, tense issue in women's physique competitions. Mm. So... My next question is a, a little bit of juxtaposition with where we're at in more modern times to Natalie and Jess. I, I mean, I've seen this and I'm, I'm a man that my, my perception of um, what is like muscular and not is, is definitely distorted in my community of lifters versus the normal community. And I have gotten, well, just don't get too big. You know, so considering that there there are far fewer restrictions on muscularity as me being a male, the fact that I've heard people like give me the cautionary advice about what to do with the weights in my body, do you feel like there is still that pressure or that concern of when you guys got into lifting that certain people wanted to protect you from what could happen to your bodies? And do you feel there's a, a stark difference between the lifting community and then just the overall society? Jess, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, for sure. I definitely do. I think that women having muscle being strong is way more accepted amongst the fitness community. But as far as the average person goes, it's kind of a, uh, it is still not so, I mean, it's not so normal, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, like when I talk to my, a lot of my coworkers, uh, for example, they're super nice and everything, but uh, they don't lift weights, most of them. So they approach it from a different, a completely different standpoint where they almost have no idea where I'm coming from when I say, oh, I squatted 400 pounds this morning or something. They just think that's totally out of left field, you know, and they, uh, yeah. So I think, I think we still have a long ways to go as far as the average person goes and social media definitely uh, amplifies that. Uh, Cause I think in the fitness community, it's fine, but I think a lot of the negative comments are coming from people who don't really lift weights. Yeah. Yeah. I like what you said about it amplifying things because I feel like it also amplifies differences, which we could say is potentially an issue that we have with bubbles and, and different differences in our societies in the West, especially at the moment, at least that we're aware of, I'm sure they exist in other societies as well, that, you know, once you kind of sequester yourself with people who you agree with the way society should be and how the viewpoints we have, you kind of grow on these different trajectories. Um, so yeah, I think it amplifies not only the normalization, which I could say is probably good within the strength community, like, I don't really have a view of what's like too muscular that is beyond kind of my perception of, cause I prefer, you know, non enhanced physiques. There's a certain level, but it is a, a sex neutral view personally. But I, I think that's something that has probably come from me being in the lifting game for 16 years rather than, I don't know, just, just, just the way it's been. Well, I, I, I wonder if that is even those boundaries have been pushed at all outside of the lifting community. So that, I think that's, that's an interesting perspective. But Natalie, I'd love to get your take. Yeah. I think um, it's worth pointing out too that even within the fitness community, there is still somewhat of a, um, there's still a divide between how women are treated, like muscular women are treated versus muscular men. Muscular men are celebrated where muscular women are treated like kind of like freaks. Like even mm -hmm. though you're still within the lifting community and you are in the fitness world and you obviously are lifting a lot and training a lot and working really hard to to obtain this physique, you're still kind of outcasted in a way. Um, and so it's not, it's not, I, I would not say it's generally accepted um, in a lot, in a, you know, just kind of br more broadly in the fitness world, because think of how often um, a, a woman that's more muscularly developed is, is accused of being on steroids or is yeah. accused of, of, you know, having, or, you know, just, ha you know, being some kind of freak in that way. Um, so I think while so a lot of people do accept it and there's just kind of a, there's more celebration compared to the general public, it's not, it's not across the board. 
And it sounds it sounds like you're saying it's it's not something that you you don't want it to come across as oh we're all good in the fitness community like there's still right yeah you you I, I mean I'm guessing you you feel limited sometimes or you feel outcasted is that is that an accurate representation of of your experience at, at times I, I I mean not necessarily me I don't have the physique that some women in powerlifting do I think that um, but I I observe it on social media that's yeah. really where I see it is is you're really like strong. The, <laughs> the natty or not threads on on reddit kind of thing yeah for sure i no um, not, omar go ahead i i do want to rant because i've never been thrown in that category i'm still waiting for the accusation <laughs> and every yeah. time i see someone Same. like i'll see i'll see jessica crush like a lift and then it's on reddit it's like is she natural and i was like why can't they accuse me of this but i i do want to say just very quickly i want to hear uh natalie and jessica uh, your perspective on this. It seems when we talk about in-group, uh, out-group, when we talk about the fitness community, we'd need to define that because I've seen, I've witnessed it, I've had it on my channel where let's say you have someone uh, uh, like Steffi Cohn is a great example where there will be accusations given against Steffi that someone else like Dan Green in the untested category, they're celebrated, right? So this guy, oh, he's real strong. Like he's a world record holder. Like, look at him. He's all tough. And then Steffi imbues those same qualities, has actually even more records than Dan all the same things, but it's like, oh, why, why are you doing? Oh, no, that's no, mm, that it's not acceptable. So as soon as you quickly eclipse past this very insular group, I would say within the fitness community, if we're talking writ large, the fitness community, I actually think it's kind of a, it's a shit show. Um, yeah. And there's immense and there's immense pressure. So I'm just wondering also maybe uh, Natalie, uh, Jessica, I don't know who uh, wants to start. I know, Jessica, you've had some videos go viral and then you see from it's like your niche following of people that have come to, you know, uh, somewhat, even somewhat, it might be tenuous even in the group. And I've seen that once again, like you're a supporter, like theoretically you're one of my supporters, but you're also talking shit. Like you're, you're kind of giving me a hate follow. It's like, not that you just can't win, but I, I do see how far away we are. And to be honest, that's the kind of scary part. Me being uh, in social media now for over 10 years, for over 10 years, I've seen the beginning and I'd say it's gotten like 2% better. And there, it's like there, there's so much more to go, you know. So I'm just wondering, uh, from your own personal experience, then probably experiencing that, go, having a video get shared well beyond your niche and all those sorts of things. I don't know who wants to start. Maybe Jessica. Um, sure. Yeah. You know what? I think uh, the thing that I dislike the most about women in strength sport is that every time there's a lifting video all the comments are about her appearance and you just appearance. don't see yeah. that with men's sports and powerlifting uh, appearance doesn't matter at all. It's only about what your body can do. Um, but yet people are always saying uh, if, if they're heavier, they're always saying, Oh, that's only twice her body weight or whatever, or uh, stuff like that. Or she's probably on steroids when if it was a man, they definitely would not say that or that'd be far fewer comments. And yeah, I've had a lot of videos that got posted outside of my kind of following and especially on Facebook. I don't know why Facebook and Reddit are so toxic, but the worst comments come from there. They're just so obscene. And what I can't believe about Facebook is that uh, these are people's actual profiles. Like I can yeah. find out absolutely everything about this person after they've said all these horrific things. So that I kind of get a kick out of in a way, but I do wish it was different and yeah, Natalie's right. We do have a ways to go in that regard. I think uh, there's there's the um, the way that women, like female athletes across the board, are portrayed in media mm. is is a problem, right? So so um, Con back to Connor's like history of women in bodybuilding and and women like in physique competitions not posing. I I've read things about how, um, even like these crazy strong women who were like able to lift men over their heads and stuff like that, still doing it and being like encouraged to not look like you're straining. Right. So still like try to look like it's try to make it look casual kind of thing. Or they would, even though this like specific woman could lift a man over her head when they were taking a photo of it, they would pose it so that she's not actually having to do it so that she could look calm, cool, and collected and attractive when doing it. So I think, um, that's a, that's something that always seems to kind of rise to the surface in this conversation is, is in sport across the board, how women are portrayed, you know, like the photos that you see of women doing 
like doing sports are usually smiling, usually like celebratory photos. They're never actually, or very rarely are they actually performing the, the sport and because they're, you know, concentrating and straining and not attractive to, uh, the, to, you know, the patriarchy. <laughs> So N- Natalie, like perfectly stole the one comment I was going to make that was going to be of you. Um, <laughs> so I was just going to say, so it's interesting, just Jessica and Natalie, when you're both talking about this, you know, Rogue Fitness did a really wonderful documentary on Katie Sandwina that I'd recommend a lot of people look at. She's an early strong woman from the 1900s. She's part of this first generation of strong women who are celebrated. There's others like Minerva, Athena, Volcana, all these wonderful names. I think powerlifting is so bland when we go back 100 years and someone is Volcana the strong woman, but we can maybe go into nicknames at a different point. But what's interesting about Sandwina, Victorina, all these early strong women is they are really strong. Obviously, they're strong women, but they are always advertised as she's really strong, but she's still mm-hmm. feminine. So when Katie Sandwina she's still goes, nice. she's still <laughs> nice, right? Yeah, she's still nice. So when Katie Sandwina is in America, there's this really lovely article written about her. And it's like, she may be a strong woman, but she's such a good mother. And you wouldn't know she's strong because her body looks like a normal woman's body. But then suddenly she can press something over her head. And someone like Victorina, who's this German strong woman in Britain in the 1880s, 1890s, she is continually depicted in her evening wear rather than in, say, her singlet or lifting weights or doing anything like this. And it's just interesting because Jan Todd has obviously written so much on this, who, again, very famous powerlifter and now a very uh, influential physical culture historian. But in the case of Sandwina and people like Minerva, they're celebrated for their, at the time, freakishness and being stronger than the average man. But there's always that caveat of, well, you wouldn't know she's strong. You know, Mm -hmm. like it's acceptable if you wouldn't know she's strong or it's acceptable uh, if in Sandwina's case, well, she's a great mom and she's two, you know, very strong kids. And she's a very delicate and beautiful frame that, you know, fits into these ideas. And I think it's interesting just how stale these sort of ideas have gone because we've kind of gone away from the motherhood angle a little bit, but not so much in other women's sports. But there's always that caveat that's placed. It's like if you, I think as a female powerlifter or bodybuilder, if you can kind of still fit in the box, it's more permissible. And Lenda Murray, the eight-time Miss Olympia, has talked about, you know, the pain in the ass it is to be a female bodybuilder because you have to worry about your hair. You have to worry about, you know, your makeup. You have to worry about all of these other things that a male bodybuilder doesn't have to. But the minute you step outside of that, then, you know, the hatred flows through of being too masculine, being freakish. So when you can fit within this box, it's sort of permissible. And this is something that's been going on for at least the last hundred years. And I think it's interesting. Social media seems to have added some benefit to it. Like things like the social media channel, you look like a man, are just really funny ways of like giving two fingers to people, you know, trolls on the internet. But it also gives these little like, you know, hatred groups more fuel to the fire. And they're just using the same arguments that people are using from 100 years ago, which is quite an interesting, I suppose, development. Mm. I also I, I was thinking about the uh, those little tick boxes, like you're, you're allowed to be muscular or strong if, you know, you still fit, you know, insert uh, required societal stereotype of women. And I feel like online that almost the, 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 the less amount you tick that box, the more likely you are to get some of those troll comments or, or those, those comments that stand out. And then I was also thinking about the, the amplification uh, that social media gives those things. I think some of that's human nature. We have a negativity bias. You know, we can see 600 hearts and one person says something really, really shitty. And it's really difficult not to focus on that, which is, you know, unfortunate, but I, I, I do it too. I think we, I think we all do it. And that then gets commented on, liked, and then the algorithm goes, oh, sweet, that's what people want to see. And then they, they take the troll comment, and now it's at the very top. And that becomes, unfortunately, the, the focus of something that could have been, uh, hey, look, look what this badass athlete did. So now it's, it's, an, interesting, it's an interesting double-edged sword. I think we've, we've talked about how social media can be that multiple times on Iron Culture, how it can amplify whatever, but it does amplify. So well, I guess I have just, a question. Go ahead, go ahead, Omar. Yeah, one thing I just wanted to chime in from being on social media, unfortunately, sometimes it's not even the rare comment, you know, depending upon Mm. how large it gets shared. Sometimes it's the majority of the comment. I'll say in a parallel way, when I was coming up, you know, creating YouTube content or whatnot, the amount of like, oh, this uh, dirty Arab, this, uh, that, the other thing, it would be so prevalent. It would be 2%, 3%, 4%. 
If you expand that over a year, it'd be several thousand comments. So it's not because I'll read other comments by individuals. Let's say we have Steffi Cohen on the channel, like, chill, bro. Like, why are you so upset by a few comments? I'm like, if you got thousands and thousands of comments every single year, so it's not, it's not just, oh, what, like, you should be tough. Like, am I, you, you should be able to be uncomfortable because my opinion is more important than your level of comfort or your dignity as a human being. That's basically, obviously, what they're saying. Uh, but it's like, just shake it off. It's like, it actually could be magnified to such a large extent that I think outsiders might not be aware of that. So if you're not, let's say, uh, a female athlete, if uh, you're not someone who's on social media, you think, <laughs> it's like, it's one cut, like, they're making a big deal. I'm like, nah, this is, this, this is the issue uh, by and large. So I've, I just want to uh, say that, that I've, I've seen it so often. And so I think some people, because Connor got that lovely email by that uh, person when we're talking about the previous episode, <laughs> when you just point out the fact that a lot of bodybuilding was dominated, the early history, like a white male centric view. And, you know, you got that lovely email of someone calling you a cuck. That's like, just keep that in mind, you know, when we're having these conversations here, because some individuals are trying to silence uh, other, let's say, voices. Yeah. And then to be clear, when I say that social media amplifies it, I, I, I definitely don't mean it wouldn't be a big deal if it wasn't for social media amplifying it. It'd just be the random comments. So, yeah, yeah. but I think that's a really good point. And I also do think that uh, I'm a not someone who is likely to get any of these comments, um, but B, I'm also a an, uh, an optimist. I, well, yeah, stop it. Um, I'm also I tend to frame things and what's the what's the best way to see a potential for for being better or or do we have hope for the future or optimism? Um, so yeah, but to be clear. I don't want to make anyone think that I, I'm going, you know what, these are the rare comment. And if it wasn't for the algorithm, there would be no sexism. I'm not saying that. Just future, so. just future proofing. Cause I read, so I read the comments on our iron culture uh, episode and I've seen like just 10 years. Like let's how many comments I've read too many. Damn. I've seen it. Jessica knows this. We talk about this all the time. We, <laughs> we've, we've been on social media too damn long where we just know we could feel it like that sixth sense of what's coming. Um, mm. one thing, uh, I just wanted to circle back to, because I thought it was a really uh, cool point that Natalie brought up and I wanted to hear your opinion, uh, Natalie, when you said, obviously this is a much larger issue. So we're seeing the echoes of what's going on here in our bubble, but you know, women, how they're portrayed in the media. When you said a uh, women in sport in general, I was thinking of the example of, let's say a Serena Williams, right? Where if she's justifiably upset and there's also the intersection, we could talk about race and, uh, other very important factors, but when she's upset. And she's, you know, uh, trying to protest to the judge. Oh, you're being dramatic. You're being this, you're being that. John McEnroe, when he used to do back in the day, oh, no, that's passion right there. So the double stand uh, on, on every on every line, it exists. But is there anything if we want to just jump back to anyone? Does anyone want to jump on that and talk a little bit outside of the fitness space and then how it relates back to where we are to maybe give some individuals some perspective? So I, I'll jump in with an Irish example. Um there's a wonderful group in Ireland and kind of their mantra is can't see, can't be. They're called 20 by 20. And effectively what they're trying to do is, and I think they may have finished up, um, I have to check, but doing what Natalie's saying, which is showing women, you know, actually playing sports. What a novel idea. Showing women actually straining, showing women, you know, actually being athletic because their mantra, and it's kind of shown out in the research that's done on these things, you know, the more you show women doing these things, the more it becomes acceptable, the more people want to do it. And I think it's something that, yeah, you know, one of one of the benefits of Instagram and social media is you can see Jess or Natalie, you know, killing the deadlift, killing killing the squat, whatever the case may be. Whereas ten years ago, fifteen years ago, it was harder to see that. And I will drop the C word into the conversation, which is obviously CrossFit, because the much maligned CrossFit, I think, did a huge amount in normalizing that to a certain extent. But I think it is a broader issue, and it's I, it, it seems to vary here in the U.S. where women's soccer, for example, gets a huge amount of attention, but other women's sports don't. I just know from my own experience in Ireland, there's more of a push to get national broadcasters to show more on women's sports. And in England, there's a lot more on women's soccer because it is this idea of the more it's hidden away, like the less it gets talked about and the less normalized these practices can be. And where people kind of go on that pedestal, and this is where I start to get the emails calling me a soy boy and a cook, of saying, well, no one wants to watch that anyway. But the research bears out that the more attention you give to it, the more interest is shown in women's sports. In Britain, they're showing more women's soccer. That is developing more interest in women's soccer. So I think it is something to and speak on. And it improves the talent pool. Yeah, exactly. it expands yeah. the talent pool too. So like, mm. you know, 10 years down the line, we have more women playing, more girls playing soccer, more talent, 
you know, then it improves the sport in general. Yeah, for sure. And it just goes back, Natalie, to your point of like visibility actually matters a huge amount. And it's, it shouldn't just be limited to one sport or one um, outlet. It should be kind of across the board. I think that's something that leads to a lot of those tensions around muscularity and femininity is it's actually not shown enough. So you get someone like that asshat who is the head of the Russian Tennis Federation calling them the Williams brothers, you know, because it's suddenly permissible to insult female muscularity because it isn't celebrated in the sport of tennis. So I think the more visibility and media attention that comes to it, the better things get to a, you know, to a certain extent and with all those caveats. But I think in Ireland, 20 by 20, can't see, can't be, shows that there is actually a net positive to giving more visibility to these things. And as you say, for sports and federations, there is a benefit because 10 years down the line, there's more women doing powerlifting. There's more you know, women playing soccer, women playing rugby, whatever the case may be. So it's one of those things that it seems like it's the tide is turning somewhat. Tide is turning? Shifting? Does tide turn or shift? Rising. 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 Rising? Yeah, yeah that's I, good, right? I think the tide, when the moon the... rotates, that's when like the tide turns. Undulating? And that's what causes sinkholes. Yeah. <laughs> where where do crazy. whirlpools fit into this? That's when the moon like, spins. I tried. Correct. You guys are hopeless. <laughs> yeah. P- PhD in strength conditioning here, so you can just take that for what it's worth. <laughs> now that you're going to say um i lost it (laughs) you're welcome it'll come back jessica Um, oh i think i got it i got it i remember go for it yeah yeah sorry just one thing so in powerlifting specifically you know 2021 is kind of a, a pretty monumental year in that uh the ipf added a weight class so now there are there's equal representation between men and women um in weight classes previously it was seven and eight or eight and nine or whatever it was and now it's equal and that's a a huge step. It's ridiculous that we're at a, we're this far in, right? Raw powerlifting is like kind of dominating, uh, this, like a lot of, uh, strength sport. And we're just now saying, huh, I think women deserve another weight class. Um, but whatever, you know, like we can, we can critique it all day, but I think it's super important to, to see that. And now we have, you know, an entire, an, an entire additional kind of like, subset of women who can compete yes that's actually i was that's exactly what i was gonna say plus <laughs> that uh i think women in powerlifting is a really good example about how giving more media attention to something um can bring more attention to it i think it's starting to be a good example because even in the past five or six years the amount of women in powerlifting has increased a ton i wish i had numbers for you guys but um even uh, the women's records like i remember in what was it 2015 2016 when i got a junior deadlift world record of 202 kilograms and uh now that record's just been blown out of the water because there's been so many more people competing and there's been so many more women in the sport you just see more reposts on instagram facebook social media channels and um i think we i think we should keep that rolling and i hope that we do absolutely i think um the standard of what people think is possible is is going up or what they're basically what's really just the threshold before someone makes a troll comment that really just means i don't believe what i just saw like is she actually a she or is she on gear or insert something terrible um you know and if if there is a crack where they, they they could they could make the comment you know i think those those cracks are 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 narrowing a little bit as it becomes more normalized which i see is only a positive um yeah and it also you know everything you guys have been saying makes me reflect on how insular my view of the i said earlier the fitness community what i absolutely meant was basically like the the competitive powerlifting and natural bodybuilding community that i operate in because I don't know or care about anything else in life. Um, so yeah, it, it's, 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 it is intriguing. And I, I just wonder how often uh, both of you experience just kind of like, you've got a community where you're, I'll say more uh, accepted, uh, more celebrated. And then is it jarring? Is it just sad? Is it frustrating? Is it angering to, when you have to step out of that? Uh, or you get someone who isn't an outgroup person who, who comments? What is that experience like, I guess, is is my question for both of you, Jess and Natalie. 
in that order just to make it easy. Yeah, I'm gonna let Jess take that because I don't I don't really get it anymore. <laughs> um, you know what? I have a really good community now. Um, sometimes it, it is still kind of a shock to see something posted on um, Facebook, like I said, Reddit, Tumblr, but it's not really a shock anymore because I'm pretty used to it. Um, in the beginning, when like maybe, yeah, five years ago, uh, it was so bad. And like Eric said, that threshold of what people think is achievable has definitely gone up because it was fake weight city every single time I would deadlift. Also, because I was obsessed with keeping a neutral uh, facial expression because uh, people would always say it was unattractive to be straining or lifting heavy, which is exactly what heavy deadlifts are. It's definitely not attractive while you're doing it because you just have all these veins in your face is all red, but um, Ooh, I love it. I love yeah, it. <laughs> it was the comments were were pretty bad, and they still are always sexual too, just because the internet is the internet and it's anonymous. But um, you do see the odd comment now, actually, where these are actual people commenting really bad things, and I think that the way the internet has gone in the past year in 2020, with how chaotic that was, has kind of opened that up again. Mm -hmm. um because before i think it was a little more anonymous but now they're actually people saying things that um can be traced and screenshotted and a lot of people don't seem to care but the odd time it catches on we have a cancel culture for sure um and that's good and can be bad sometimes but it's kind of strange what is uh what catches that fire and what goes viral yeah yeah, so I think that there's often an opportunity for education in those realms. Like, so I think a few years ago, like Jess was saying, maybe five or six years ago, or early, even earlier when I started lifting, it would it would kind of like it would get an emotional reaction out of me. Someone would comment, like you know, try to critique how I'm benching or you know things like that. Basically, like inserting themselves to try to provide some kind of guidance, right? Like I don't need that. Um, that I think often can be an opportunity for education. And I think a lot of women in the sport have kind of capitalized on that. So you see tons of people providing like educational resources on, you know, in response to a comment about arching on bench, here's why we're doing that. Like no one ever, you know, people rarely comment on men's benching videos about their bench arch, but we, that's a whole different, that's a whole different ball of wax, but um, you know, an opportunity for education. And that I think, by kind of broadcasting that that message and that education definitely helps kind of one for like someone like Jess with a huge social media following, your followers can often probably provide that education in the comments rather than you having to do it every single time exhausting, like, you know, exhausting yourself, like emotionally trying to explain this whole thing. Like you can rely on a lot of people who follow you probably to do that. But yeah, that's just one thought that I had about you know, how we kind of try to turn this in a positive direction, I think is, mm. is provide that, provide that education and, and kind of capitalize on that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a really good way to frame it. Uh, and it, it is, I guess, one of those, those uh, other sides of the double-edged sword is that once you're able to generate a community that, that has celebrated you and accepted you, at least at writ large, um, then they won't accept someone coming in and just, you know, taking a shit in your comments. So, um, so I think, I think that is a positive for sure. Um, and I think people see that all the time. It's not always, you know, like there, there's certain instances where, where, you know, having zealous followers defend you at all costs is, is not great. Like I'm at times I have, you know, mentioned, and I don't know if that makes sense from an evidence-based perspective. And, you know, next thing I know, I'm a lab coast pansy hat wearing fuckwad who just got banned, but Hey, um, that's why you need a bodyguard, Eric. And that's I need why, you. No, Jessica that's why. has my back. There's a frozen oh, turkey see. always ready. Like she's like she's like <laughs> you're gonna get clapped up to anyone. So I I feel secure. I I, I love it. Fear for who else wants to step up on that. So I'm just saying afterwards. That's what's up. I will yeah. I will uh, hire the, the the frozen turkey swinging bodyguard uh, uh, if, if she has availability, of course. Um, so 
I love that. We had a, we had a really good discussion there, and now we're going to come back to uh, the story arc that we left in, in season one of this podcast. Um, take us further along the journey in women's bodybuilding progression, uh, Dr. Heffernan, if you don't mind. Yeah, no worries. So should I do like previously on this podcast? Is that really cheesy? <laughs> Real quick, and I want to hear an American voice that sounds a little bit mysterious and also mm. kind of ominous. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm not going to do that. So okay. what previously on Iron Culture. <laughs> Omar's got you. Yeah. <laughs> I've been sold with so many Texans that I've just decided not to do accents um, ever. I also learned that bless your heart is an insult in Texas. I thought it was being sweet. If you're like, oh, bless your heart, it's kind of like, oh, you poor idiot. But I've been using that in like grocery stores, trying to like integrate myself more with the community here. They, yeah, I love Texas, but on New Year's, a few of our cars in the neighborhood, the windscreens, bullets went through them because people were shooting their guns in the air. So I love Texas, but it also scares me. So previously on Iron Culture, that was a tangent. So where we left it, we have the Miss Olympia uh, competition starting in 1980. The first competition is won by Rachel McLish. She's a very kind of lean, spelt, but muscular physique by 1985 there is kind of this crisis in women's bodybuilding and a lot of this crisis is brought about by bev francis the great australian powerlifter who has the quote unquote you know the audacity to move into women's bodybuilding and if anyone is interested pumping iron too yes there is another pumping iron this one is called the ladies or the women so it's not very imaginative but pumping iron too details this tension between Bev Francis, who seemed to have this overly muscular physique, and then the rest of the women's bodybuilding division. And it's really hacky and like really on the nose, but it's also a lot reflects a lot of the criticisms I think even say Natalie and Jess that you're bringing up, where Bev Francis goes on stage, you know, she's clearly the most muscular woman. If this is actually a bodybuilding contest, she wins, like hands down. The minute she gets off stage, she's backstage with her husband, and she kind of jokes in like the way Australian people do, where they're telling the truth, but saying it as a joke. And she's saying, did I look too masculine? Ha ha ha. So even in Pumping Iron 2, so that's five years after kind of women's bodybuilding starts, we get these tensions between, you know, what is too muscular, what isn't too muscular. And these tensions will flow through women's bodybuilding from 1985 to really 2014, when the Miss Olympia contest is canceled. And we get different eras of women's bodybuilding stars. So Corey Everson, Cara Dunlap, they're seen as kind of in the dark recesses of the internet where men comment on women's bodybuilding. The Corey Everson era is seen as kind of the last point when women's bodybuilding was aesthetic or attractive. Um, Because Eric, as you know from bodybuilding, how attractive your face is, is really going to make or break the contest. All bodybuilding shows start from the neck up. So it's really important to be, you know, physically (laughs) attractive. As a serious comment on that, uh, in certain divisions, that is actually a true statement. Yeah, <laughs> true statement. Um, but you know, in the round, a bodybuilding show should probably be from the neck down, um, aside from one dazzling smile, which is always important. But we get really interesting kind of evolutions in the 1990s, in particular, when the IFBB, the International Federation of Bodybuilding, who oversees the Miss Olympia contest, they start to really worry about the muscularity of female contestants. But not for the reasons that you may think. So men's bodybuilding in the late 1980s, early 1990s is something of a shit show because this is the moment when diuretics are being used and abused. People are collapsing on stage. Andres Munzer actually dies because of complications uh, from steroid abuse. And a lot of the anxieties around male steroid use start to infiltrate into women's bodybuilding, even though so the physiques are becoming more muscular. But we're not seeing people collapsing on stage. We're not seeing an overabuse of diuretics as we're seeing in male competitions. But the IFBB and the Miss Olympia start to ask contestants to slim down and look more feminine. And there will be letters sent out to contestants. Uh, this, one of these letters actually sent out during Lenda Murray's reign during the 1990s, asking them to achieve a more feminine look. In the early 2000s, the Miss Olympia contestants, or the organizers, pardon me, will outright say, reduce your muscularity by 20% before next year's contest. And Eric, I know you are the doyen of evidence-based training. I'm not sure how one reduces 20% muscularity, you know, very easily, uh, unless maybe it's starvation. But aside from that, I'm not really too sure. Well, if we're talking about the IFBB Miss Olympia uh, in the 2000s, I could make a facetious joke about reducing the, the, the steroid dosage by 20%. 
But I think your point is more so that no one is asking the male division to reduce their muscularity. They're saying stay as muscular, but somehow just don't have those side effects that we, we don't like, like a distended gut. And they're like, but I have to take a buttload of GH and it's making everything grow. You're rewarding Ronnie Coleman. How do I compete with this guy? I need to retain my sides. What do you want me to get my, some of my, my intestines surgically removed? And the judges are probably going, hmm, <laughs> you know? So, so your, 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 your point is well taken, uh, my friend. That, that is the point. So obviously, like, it would be very naive and facetious to say anabolic steroids do not play a role in men's bodybuilding at the Mr. Olympia and women's bodybuilding at the Miss Olympia. But there is this outright tension where they say, whereas with men, they're like, just keep getting bigger. Like the bodybuilding community at one point is split because Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, like the god for so many people in 90s and 2000s bodybuilding says, this is getting out of control. Like we were taking steroids, but y'all are going crazy. You know, reduce the dosages, reduce the guts. He criticizes Dorian Yates for having like a freakish or mass monster physique. So for male bodybuilding, they're split. They're like, we want these mass monsters, but Arnold's telling us not to like them. What do we do? Let's just keep rolling with the mass monsters. In women's bodybuilding, it's you look too massy. You look too manly. We know that this division in the Miss Olympia is all about muscularity and symmetry. But I mean, we didn't, we didn't actually mean muscularity and symmetry like that. We wanted it, you know, from like the early 80s. We didn't want it like this. So you get things asking them to, you know, reduce their muscularity. We get differentiations in poses, which have always existed between men's and women's bodybuilding. But we get a kind of a chorus of critiques and criticism. And the bodybuilding community and the organizers are kind of shitty because the money starts to run away from the Miss Olympia contest. So there are instances in the early to late 2000s where the Miss Olympia, we're not sure if it's going to run or not because the organizers are saying, you know, well, it's not profitable anymore. We can't run this show. And this is one of the reasons that's given for the cancellation of Miss Olympia in 2014. Now, that's shown maybe not to be the right argument because Wings of Strength and Rising Phoenix, which emerges in 2015 to 2019, they now run the Miss Olympia. They show it can be done profitably. But we get this sense that from like the mid-90s, when Linda Murray is really still winning her Olympias, and she's an eight-time Mr. Olympia, uh, Miss Olympia, pardon me, Iris Kyle is a 10-time Miss Olympia. But when Linda Murray is winning her Olympias, there's kind of a sense that the IFBB, the Miss Olympia contest, they don't know what to do with women's bodybuilding because they're now coming under, under a chorus of critiques that this is too masculine, that this isn't, you know, the f contestants aren't feminine, that this isn't the right sort of bodybuilding. And this, you know, intensifies as we move into the Iris Kyle era. And she is, you know, the most successful bodybuilder of all time, 10 time Miss Olympia. But her reign is almost, you know, marred by the fact that she's been criticized by fans who aren't fans of women's bodybuilding, but bodybuilding more generally by the general public for being quote unquote too masculine. And it's a combination of societal prejudices against muscular women. And then also like competitor or organizers uncomfortableness with these muscular physiques. And there's a wonderful interview with Landa Murray on YouTube where she talks about how, I think I've mentioned this already, how much of a pain it was to worry about hair, makeup, nails, you know, high heels, et cetera, as a female contestant. But she also makes the point that, you know, she never did women's bodybuilding or Miss Olympia bodybuilding to find a partner or to find a mate. You know, it was to build muscularity, to build a certain kind of physique. And she enjoyed that physique. And there's always been this tension in women's bodybuilding of like, well, I wouldn't want to go out with her. I wouldn't want her to be my wife. It's like, yeah, but that's not really the point of the show. I mean, if we want to go back to Bernard McFadden and Emma Newkirk in the early 1900s. But he's saying, you know, she won the contest, but even better, she's married now, so I've done my job. Then maybe those comments, while still wrong, are more acceptable. But when we get to like the 80s, 90s, 2000s, there's never been a criteria of like dateability uh, on women's bodybuilding, but it seems to be one of the critiques and criticisms. I think that's often leveled against it. So the tensions emerged in 1985. They're intensified in the 90s, Eric, as you say, like rightly, you know, steroid use, male and female, increases exponentially in the 90s and early 2000s. By the early 2000s, it's clear that the IFBB and the Miss Olympia, while still supporting women's bodybuilding, are growing increasingly uncomfortable with it. They're worried that it's not making enough money. They're worrying that it's alienating fans. And this culminates in 2014 when the Miss Olympia contest is cancelled. 
And we're not sure if it's going to come back. Wings of Strength and Rising Phoenix come in in 2015 as a kind of placeholder. But I don't think people appreciate how shitty it is to cancel like the pinnacle of someone's sport. Iris Kyle is a 10-time Miss Olympia. She could have been 11, 12, 13, 14. She was meant to come back this year, but unfortunately had some very serious health complications. I think the night of the Miss Olympia return. So she's talked about this at length in one of the Generation Iron movies as well. She talks about this. Yes, I watched the Generation Iron movies. Um, she talks about this as well, that you know your pinnacle, your Super Bowl is taken away. And it's not taken away for sporting reasons per se, but more kind of social reasons and social unease. So what I'm going to do now is just step off my soapbox and come back into the room. Uh, Cause again, I think I've talked a little bit too much. And as season two of iron culture concludes, Natalie Hansen has a comment. Can you imagine if that, if that, even if it's not an official conversation about the, the, um, women being able to find partners or like being dateable was flipped. And can you imagine if they were asking those same questions about Ronnie Coleman and like all these big dudes that are, you know, like world famous for their bodybuilding? Like that's, that's where I kind of like, that's how I kind of get, you know, like create some sort of um, context in my brain. And that would be outrageous. I'm picturing Ronnie Cry right now. Being asked that question, like you think, bro, you think anyone wants to date that? And he's like, I don't know. It's like, oh god, Ronnie, I'm lonely. <laughs> Nat- Natalie, like, oh. I'm really glad you you brought up the idea of flipping it because I think a lot of people, and I'll include myself in this, um, believe in their in their mind and their heart, and they state that uh, my values are such that we should not limit someone based upon their sex or gender, um, and I that's the way I want the world to be. However, we don't often. We're not good at putting ourselves in the shoes of other people to, to really kind of think like, oh, shit, that is shitty, too. That's just some piece of, of society that you haven't acknowledged. And I think that's a really um, I think it's a useful practice. Uh, it has been for me just to think like, all right, well, that person is describing something that they're angry about. It's not obvious to me. I could either just be like huh, crazy person or I could try to put myself in their shoes and maybe attempt to try to understand their worldview. And uh, I would encourage people to do that. You know, if there is something where uh, any group is is feeling underrepresented or uh, that they're they're not getting the same fair treatment. And if that's something you supposedly c- care about, try to think if there if there might be a double standard by, by flipping the script and. I mean, you could make the argument that Irish Kyle is the most dominant bodybuilder in the modern era. Um, you could maybe make some arguments of people in like the 30s and 40s. Like, I, I am impressed that they had to change the rules for a competition for John Grimmick. Like, that's something to say. But um, but at 10 times Miss Olympia and then going, oh, wow, we, we've got this. We have like the Wayne Gretzky rolled into Michael Jordan over here. But you know what? We don't need the sport anymore. <laughs> it's fine. Like, that. that's kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Connor. I was just actually sorry on Natalie's point. There's actually a really good Twitter account called The Man Who Has It All. And it does exactly that, where it flips the script. And it's so funny. It's like, you know, stay at home, dad. How does he keep saying? You know, asking dad, how do you balance work and t- family care at the same time? And I think maybe we could have like the lifter who has it all and maybe just mm. kind of flip that script a little bit. Because yeah, it is interesting, Natalie, as you say, like these aren't discussions that people have in men's bodybuilding after Andreas Munzer, after people are collapsing on stage with diuretics, it's, as Eric said, well, how do we keep the mass monsters going, you know, without the tank running on E? Like, how do, how do we, you know, keep getting muscular without worrying about these side effects? Whereas with women, it's sort of, oh, she looks masculine, you know, she's losing her quote-unquote femininity. And like, again, to give a very college answer, femininity is a construct. Like, I mean, the, you know, it varies exactly. depending on cultures, it varies depending on societies. <laughs> Like, it's a spectrum, like all things. And, you know, yeah. we don't need to go down that route too much. But it is interesting that we reach a point in fitness and in other communities where it's very narrowly defined. And it's when we get um, challenges to that. And Leslie Hayward, a bodybuilder and academic, has written on this. When there are challenges to that, we really revert back to, like, the most, like, narrow, confined, stereotypical idea. Like, so, Jessica, you're talking about, you know, doing a deadlift and not trying to strain. I make the ugliest faces when I deadlift like a third of what you deadlift. And like never in my mind am I thinking, do I have a neutral face? 
right now because no one's ever going to comment on that. They'll comment on the weak historian in the corner. But it's just interesting that, you know, when we get challenges to it, like you two lifting very heavy weights, people revert back to like, well, no, no, no. Like a woman is meant to be, you know, whatever this madman inspired like role for women is. So I think that's quite an interesting thing. Um, talking about flipping the role, I, uh, yeah, I think that's a super good point because I think that those people that say, ew, that woman is too muscular, uh, don't realize that that woman in particular probably does not find them attractive based on their physique either. So that's something that I just, that I ponder quite often. I always go, the odd time, these comments don't really bug me that much anymore. Uh, but I do the odd time go to these people's profile just to see. And yeah, it's just <laughs> never a good idea. <laughs> no. Oh man. All the trolls are emasculated. <laughs> we we really have to be nicer to trolls on here. I, I've heard that's, that's uh, they, they deserve to be Their mental too. well-being <laughs> is at risk here, Eric. Are you okay, yeah. my dude? I know you feel emasculated <laughs> by seeing these big lifts in your uh, fragile version of masculinity here feels in crisis so you feel the need to overcompensate by pulling someone else down but are you okay like are you is everything fine i mean in in all seriousness for me to put myself in the position where i would make those comments i would need to not be okay so maybe we should be concerned about these people but uh yeah natalie now, you were saying yeah. something um, I'm still kind of back on like the concept of the dateability and like finding a partner and how like that's literally never been why women compete in sport, like not even ever. <laughs> so it's not so to advertise any sport as like this is great because she found a partner. That's like not that's just not even how it works. And the it's such a backwards logic to me. Well, I personally, I always go to sporting events to try to find a, a potential spouse, um, despite the fact that I'm married. But oh, I found um, Eric. But maybe I'm weird. I don't know. So <laughs> I also think no. it hurts uh, uh, some people to know it's like your opinion doesn't matter to me at doesn't all. Doesn't matter. Like your your worldview means nothing to me. Like you have not yeah. no power in this sphere whatsoever. It's like, but wait, but 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 my opinion. Like you should. You, I'm entitled to tell you my opinion, and it should have real world consequences. I'm like, nah doesn't work that way it's like but yeah. but uh, uh. yeah, <laughs> yeah like good. assuming yeah. that they assuming that the subject wants your acceptance or right. wants the mm. troll i acceptance, don't right <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah i don't need it <laughs> yeah i uh, just a quick uh to make it a little lighter real quick when jessica said going on the profile photos of just seeing you know like all right this person said something let's see uh what happened we went down i went down a rabbit hole i mean it happens not <laughs> to the same extent at all but this guy, this kid okay, was like, bro, you think you look good? You're posting all these shirtless photos. Fo you, huh? You think you look good? It's like, you look terrible. I was like, all right. And then like, he just kept it up. <laughs> Anyways, then he sent me a message. He's like, you think you're a big tough guy or whatever, huh? And he's like, uh, what? And then he eventually sent a photo of himself in a towel saying, this is what a real man looks like. I was like, I'm like oh, okay. Here's the, here's the way that we're going. It's like, you like you, you think you know the story sometimes, but just the way that he sounds like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, yeah, no, right. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, that's, that's, a, that's a different way. That's a different ending. Cool. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. You never know how it's going to end is what I'm saying. You never know what angle someone's coming at you, you know, with. You didn't realize that you were being courted, Omar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Omar, has, has anyone ever slid into your DMs and asked if you could pick them up? Can you lift me up? Oh, yeah. No, I, so I, I, I shared with uh, Jessica. I think it is just a consequence of having, you know, a, a certain, uh, accruing a certain following. But we'll talk uh, shit with each other all the time about, like, this person said this or, like, this DM. And it's, I'll say, uh, let's not derail this. It gets wild. Yeah. yeah. I do, I, I do want to say there's so much positivity, though. And I, I'd be, miss if i didn't uh mention this because i actually saw now that you were uh drinking um uh, that bottle i saw the buff chicks uh logo where mm. there's a lot of people doing a lot of really good things so first i have to give a, a, a quick shout out to meg squats because i thought uh, the video that when she announced her supplement company and just how she crafted it just how well done it was and there's people really trying to make a concerted effort in order to empower and embolden uh, women. Uh, you know, her uh, entire mission, I'm not trying to speak uh, for her, but is uh, trying to get barbells, uh, more barbells into a woman's hands. And you see the real world consequences where I saw her channel. So like I said, by social media, I I'm ancient. Okay, like oof, before 2010, wow. And so I saw when Meg Squats came there, uh, came on the scene. 
And I saw one she was documenting her journey and where once again, it, it kind of, it was, it was different, right? To the fitness community. Like, oh, what uh, you do? Like, what? Oh, you don't do bodybuilding? It's like, no, I don't do bodybuilding. Like, I actually do powerlifting. It's like, you do power, what, what's powerlifting? What's, but, why, but why do you do? It's like, because I enjoy it. Oh, you enjoy it? It's like, yeah. Uh, so you you see that from 2014 uh, to now, and you do see that seismic change. And I think Eric probably, or so, someone here, or Wikipedia, Siri, can you get me the answer? Is uh, the number of entrants in powerlifting, the number of female entrants has risen dramatically. I, I I know this just anecdotally going to me. It's like, let's say 2012 to now, there's real world consequences to the positivity that's done to getting that exposure. And as you said, uh, Natalie, the visibility. So the visibility uh, creates more entrants, raises all things is kind of a reciprocal relationship i'm just wondering from both of you and i'll start because i saw that buff chick uh uh uh, sticker on there some of the positives that have come about like let's say some of the uh female initiatives that have really had positive consequences i don't know if there's anything you want to talk about anything you want to launch off of well i think just to your point about the participation i think it's close to 60 40 now in i don't know if that's in usa powerlifting or if that's the IPF, I can't exactly remember, but I've recently dug up those numbers for somebody and then I lost them in my head. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think that truly there have been so many, so many positive um, role models on social media, Meg being a, a very key one um, that really just brings strength sport to the masses. And we don't necessarily have to call it powerlifting, right? So like, yes, we're doing the power lifts and, but we're not saying now you compete in a powerlifting meet. Really, it's just strength training for the, for the general population and basically allowing women to feel uh, that the empowerment as, you know, kind of from getting stronger um, and the general health benefits of getting stronger and just being able to like live life and, uh, exist more harmoniously in this world because you feel stronger and more empowered and more positive about it. So I think that that's been, um, you know, we, we have talked for, you know, an hour about a lot of negative stuff. So I think it's, it is important to bring light to what, what, what women like more representation in sport has done. And that's, yeah. Love it. If, if, if I may, I like, also go ahead, Jess. Oh, I was just going to say, I love that we're seeing more women in influential roles in regards to, to strength. Like we see uh, Meg squats. I love what she's doing as well. Uh, we see Steffi, who's a lifter, uh, coach. Um, you see, it's just, it's just really nice to see. And then you get a lot of, uh, you see people putting uh, their kids, uh, male and female, in a lot of strength classes, at least I see that in our community here in Saskatchewan, for sure. And it's just a really positive growth. Hundred percent agree. And while we're on uh, po- positive vibes here, I I'm going to attempt not to disrail us because I I've been trying to, I guess I'm trying to understand the trolls, and I think uh, a charitable view of some of them and maybe what they think is happening. Because I just have to understand, and, and, and Iron Cult's about bringing people together. I don't think we're going to bring the trolls in, but, but maybe, just maybe, uh, some people might be under the impression that by bucking the restrictions that are, that, are, that are out there based on someone's sex or gender, that they're maybe trying to enforce something. That's almost the way they respond. Like, like is it you want all women to be, you're going to try to change us. You know, you're going to convert us to the powerlifting devil or something like that. That's almost the feeling I get when I read some of those comments as though it's almost this, uh, this expectation that by simply you doing what you want to do and being who you are as a human, that somehow that is a statement about the way you think others should. Be. And, it, and it might be. I, I think everyone should lift weights. We've, we've well established that belief system on our own culture. Um, but I think, I think it's an interesting one when you apply it to, to bodybuilding. Because uh, the, the sport of bodybuilding, and we talked about this before, Connor, um, you said, hey, it's it's gone through a lot of tumultuous social problems because it's been about kind of the, the idealized physique and it's been tied to uh, your personality, your morals, your societal acceptability, if we talk about like the Mr. America competition, which has potential for interesting things, like we want you to have more holistic uh, development as a human, but if it's viewed through the lens of, I don't know, 1940s America, that means 
certain people aren't going to win, uh, which is not good. But it's, it's, this, it's this thing you said, maybe we're now at the point where bodybuilding can just be a sport, you know? And I think that's where we want to get to. But I think it is very challenging to do that with, with respecting everyone's individual take on who they want to be. Um, so, for example, the, I have always struggled with the uh, men's physique and the bikini classes and the different gradations. And on one, on one hand, I think it's 100% fine if someone identifies with the more traditional idea of femininity or masculinity. I think some people, you don't have control over A, what you're attracted to, what you think is fine. And I have zero issue with that so long as you're not limiting others or, or trying to impose limitations on society, you know? But if you're like, you know what, I actually really like quote unquote femininity and looking like the bikini, uh, you know, ideal of, men, uh, of, of a physique competition, more power to you. But I, I'm, I'm thinking, and I'd love to get your take on this, Connor, that these divisions, there's a reason why they keep popping up, going away, changing, new ones get added. And sometimes, damn it, not that I want to impose this on the whole sport. I wish we just had bodybuilding. <laughs> Period. Go. Okay. So first, as the Southern American representative on this panel, uh, I do take umbrage with your troll comment, clearly being um, from the Southern states, but we'll leave that aside for one minute. I think, you know, for men's or women's um, bodybuilding in particular, and it actually it speaks to something that Natalie is talking about as well when you mentioned the different divisions for men and women, you know, having parity between the two. In bodybuilding, there has always been this kind of split um, goal or this split motivation between, you know, patronizing the sport, making sure everyone can get involved, and also what's commercially viable. So the emergence of women's bikini divisions or even, say, men's physique or men's classic, some of that is motivated by bodybuilding trying to correct perceived ills. So like men's physique or men's classic, that comes about on the board shorts, comes about because they want more people to get into the sport of bodybuilding, but they're afraid that the quote unquote mass monsters, like no, not everyone's going to look like Big Ramy. Big Ramy sometimes doesn't look like Big Ramy. You know, <laughs> not everyone wants to look like that. So then they create these new divisions to try and appeal to new people. And similarly, like with some of the women's um, physique or bikini classes that have emerged, they're trying to make it more open because people are being put off by kind of the elite level. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. And I think the more outreach you have, the better. But I think the problem comes when the same federations then start to privilege certain divisions and certain classes over mm -hmm. others. Now, in men's bodybuilding, at the end of the day, the bread and butter for diehard fans is still the Olympia. But at a regional level, and Eric, you'll know this as well, there's so much more money to be made locally from board shorts and classic and physique than from open bodybuilding. So we start to see more regional shows pivoting more towards that in the men's sense. In women's bodybuilding and women's physique show, at an elite level, the organizers have taken the decision to privilege say, the bikini classes over the open Miss Olympia. And that is where the problems start to arise. Because when the competitor or the people organizing the competitions take an active role in pivoting the conversation or the narrative. We've talked so much about media and we haven't mentioned Lord Zuckerberg, you know, pivoting the narrative towards one end of the spectrum rather than the other. That becomes problematic because when you start to privilege one pathway over another, then the other one will start to die away. And that is what happens with the Miss Olympia in 2014. There's more money and more interest. It's easier to sell to the outside community if we just have the bikini divisions. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. And I think the more divisions you have, probably the better. Although as someone who's competed in natural bodybuilding shows, it's such a pain in the ass how long a bodybuilding show is. And I know the powerlifters will know similarly. The more divisions are great, but it's also a real pain in the ass because the competitions are so much longer. But I think when the competitors or the organizers start to really direct people away from one pathway to another, that's where it's problematic because... In the case of women's bodybuilding, I think both of you have actually spoken on this as well. So much of this is rooted in the origins of female weight training in the 1800s, which is defined by three Bs, um, babies, brains, and backs. Because when people are writing about women's exercise in the 1810s, 1820s, and 1830s, they're saying women should exercise because it'll make them better mothers. Or women should exercise because they'll have, quote unquote, brain fatigue from doing too much you know, learning or book learning. Or backs. Women are inherently delicate, inherently frail, 
And, you know, they need to do some level of mild activity to bring their body back to its, you know, natural harmonious or harmonious state. Also, babies, backs and, you know, brains is the title of my upcoming memoirs, if anyone's interested. <laughs> but we are rooted so much in kind of ideas from the 1800s that relate to what a woman was expected to be in the 1800s. And they've just taken slight evolutions along the way. And I think when you, you know, take attention away from the Miss Olympia and give all your attention to, say, the bikini classes, you are implicitly reiterating the importance of traditional narratives and you're shutting a door on, you know, identities that maybe don't fit in with the norm. And that's not to denigrate the bikini classes, but it's just to say that not privileging something or not giving something attention is really detrimental to that cohort that enjoys doing that sport. And I think the one wonderful thing, if there was a wonderful thing about the Miss Olympia being cancelled is Rising Phoenix and Wings of Strength. Again, going back to fuck you energy and fuck you motivation. They said there is a place for this. We should have these sports. We will continue this open women's bodybuilding division. And then eventually it comes back into the fold because the Mr. Olympia, the Olympia Festival needs to have more variety and needs to have more interest. And bringing that open division back in allows them to do that. So I think it's problematic when identities or no strict ideas about what femininity is meet with kind of ruthless capitalism. And we move away from what I would say is a service to the sport because the weeders, Ben and Joe Weeder, you know, God rest our souls, he's very Irish aphorism. They tried to make bodybuilding an Olympic sport and they're continually trying to make bodybuilding an Olympic sport. Bodybuilding is part of the Pan American Games before COVID. And this is seen as another step towards integrating bodybuilding into the Olympics. We don't need to go into whether or not that's a good idea. But if you see even an inkling of yourself as an Olympic sport, then sport for all is something that you have to do. Even if you're saying, well, the Miss Olympia doesn't make us enough money. If you want to be an Olympic sport, it's kind of tough shit. Like you should be opening it out to all divisions. So I've gone halfway up my soapbox this time, not the whole way up. But I would just say that the emergence of the bikini divisions has been wonderful because it's got more people in but it became problematic when organizers at a local national international level began to privilege this one division to the detriment we're not even talking about 60 40 in terms of attention by 2014 it was like 80 85 to 15 maybe in terms of the attention that was being given to those two divisions and that's when it's problematic yeah and it's Go, sorry, go ahead, Natalie. I was just gonna. I was gonna make a joke about Eric's sentiment that maybe sometimes he wishes there was just bodybuilding. Um, is similar to somebody saying sometimes they wish there was just equipped powerlifting, mm-hmm. <laughs> because the raw is the accessible division to the world. But uh, and that, but that's also what has brought the sport to the masses. So mm. that's up for a different podcast, I think. <laughs> well, you know, we we've had threads of that on each one of them, and I think. I think I, I like that you said ruthless capitalism, Connor, because I think, and and I, I'm not an anti-capitalist by any means, but I think sometimes some of the narratives in that space, it's almost like, hey, the market does what it does. I have no influence on that, which is, that's just not the way human behavior works in any domain. And I think, and we've talked about this off air before, uh, Omar, but I think the, the echoes of what are, what happens at the the high level in the sport is dictating the mindset of the amateur competitors. So I'm talking about local natural bodybuilding shows, basically where I spent you know 30 percent of my life cut your from teeth pretty much from two, 2005 all the way up to, to you know in, until I moved to New Zealand and then it's just a little bit less because uh, it's it's a small country and if I drive the distance of what would be California to Seattle I'm I'm drowning now in New Zealand. So uh, logistical problems only, but I still fly out and go to these shows and coach and I have athletes competing all over the world in this stuff. And the echoes of what was happening in the highest level where uh, bodybuilding was dying, uh, I would say, like you said, uh, due to choices, uh, not just purely going, oh, well, no one wants to do it. Um, but it's, you know, you're, you're aiding along that death at the very least. It was never the super most popular division and that's fine. Um, but one of the things I noticed is that the figure division, which was incredibly popular, um, had an era where it got a little more muscular and then bikini opened up and it moved from there. And then, okay, well, bodybuilding went away, but we still have people who want to do figure, but they don't want to do bikini. So now we're going to create uh, the Miss Physique or the Physique division. And it, it created all these very strange dynamics. And a lot of the times, the decisions about organization or the decisions organizations make 
about the divisions are very much monkey see monkey do. And just to show you how much it's not necessarily responding to a market, but just responding to groupthink, which of course does impact the market as well. But one example is I've always thought it was hilarious that natural bodybuilding organizations, mm -hmm. some, not all, um, adopted the like the classic bodybuilding division for men or, or the, the men's. And I'm like, you realize the only reason this is created in the IFBB is just so there could be a steroids light division. So we could control the gut. So some people are like, no, I don't feel like dying at 45 uh, could, could, could have an outlet, but still to be on a, a non negligible amount of anabolic steroids. <laughs> So, and then they're like, oh shit, I guess we got to copy them because we're a natural body. I'm like, no, no, you don't because you don't have that problem. You just need to think a little bit. So it's, it's a tough one, but you know, Connor, you, you sort of answered my question in that you need access. Um, the question of what the division should be is a much more challenging one because the ideas of what should be in the sport of bodybuilding are changing. And I, I do think that the only way it's going to make sense is to either go one way or the other, where we remove some of the more um, construct-related views of, of what a female or male physique athlete should look like and make the, the criteria very similar. But at the same time, if someone does want to compete in a quote-unquote you know, bikini division, they wouldn't have anywhere. So I don't think my advice is, is necessarily the way to go of just having bodybuilding divisions. Um, but maybe those divisions sh should be changing a lot, should be updating themselves. I don't know, but I do know that um, with ideas getting spread faster and society changing at a more rapid rate with increased communication between people, it's going to be a, a an organizational shit show for a long time. And I'm, I'm a proud, proud member of that community. <laughs> so, so on that point, I would say bodybuilding suffers from like, and I love bodybuilding. I study it for some reason. I've starved myself, which is what natural bodybuilding is in Ireland, you know, but it suffers from the fact that it's really so subjective. Like this is the problem. Like powerlifting has its problems, but at the end of the day, like a 500 pound deadlift, number. it's a number, right? Like we can just attach it, like your weight, like your actual body weight, the weight you lift at the very least, we can agree on those two things. If you go to any bodybuilding show, men's or women's and just say political decision, eh? like admitted, like 20 people will come in straight away and agree with you. So I think, Part of the problem is bodybuilding exists in this weird nexus of like inherently we are judging based on the beauty standards of the day. And yep. I don't think I'd like the judges say that they accept this, the organization like admitted, but I don't think they're like steadfast enough in their beliefs for saying that this is exactly it. These are the rules. We want this. We don't want that. And going back to Eric's point, this is when you see like, well, shit, I guess we should do classic. I mean, okay. This is what we should do. Like there isn't this clear line running throughout the sport. And I think that's very problematic. Whereas at least in powerlifting, weightlifting, CrossFit, there are numbers. And I think yeah. bodybuilding, the, looking at the state of the sport, I think it's probably going to become more confused because bodybuilding promoters are really good at making money, or at least in their minds, they're really good at making money. Um, but I know, I know, I know. But they think they're good at making money. So I think they'll continue to expand and we probably will start to see collapsing inward because they're kind of overreaching, whereas at least in powerlifting, you can add another weight division, but we, we have that objectivity. And part that objectivity probably explains why, historically speaking, powerlifting has been more open to women. So the first American powerlifting meet for women is in 1977. You know, Jan Todd has written a number of articles on this. There are early kind of um, protagonists in women's powerlifting, and they talk about how open and accepting it was because that subjectivity was taken away. You know, mm -hmm. if you see Dan Todd or some of these other women on the platform and they're pulling 300, 400, 500 pounds in a deadlift, whatever the case may be, like it's hard to be an asshole in real life to someone who's that strong. I mean, you can do it, many do. But I think that objectivity explains and one of the reasons why powerlifting historically has been much better in terms of accepting women. Now there is a period where they don't celebrate that enough, I would say, in the late 80s and early 90s. And now with social media, we, we're starting to see that again. But I think the objectivity of powerlifting is really one of its positive sides, because when you're dealing with subjectivity, you're dealing with humans, and humans are dumb monkeys who learn to talk. Whereas at least in powerlifting, the dumb monkey who learned to talk can respect, you know, a heavy can count just about on our fingers. <laughs> 
you know, 100, yeah. 200, 200. And <laughs> One red, two red, three red. Yeah, exactly. So it's just interesting, <laughs> you know, speaking maybe to Jasper and Natalie, like, I think the objectivity as an outsider in powerlifting is one of the reasons why it's probably more of an open space because historically that's one of the reasons why it was more acceptable and more encouraged for women to lift because they could go in, there was clear targets, there was clear boundaries, there was clear roles. Now, Jan Todd and the other women of the late 1970s had to fight and petition very hard to get those competitions. But once the competitions emerged in the late 70s, early 80s, it was kind of like, away you go. Like now we're set in stone. And as a final point, like Jan even mentions some of her articles when she was going to lift the Dinny Stones, you know, a number of powerlifters came up and was like, yeah, you should totally just take steroids. And she was like, okay, I'm not going to, but thank you. Whereas like in bodybuilding, it's, you know, yeah, you should really not take steroids because, you know, you look masculine, like it'll ruin your femininity. Whereas powerlifting, they're like, take gear, don't take gear, use straps, use a belt, don't use a belt, whatever, just lift the damn weight. So I think the objectivity has a benefit. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, just on one minor correction, uh, we're, we're apes, not monkeys, but uh, well, we'll let it slide. <laughs> Important stuff that I bring to the podcast, folks. Um, I'm in Texas, so I'm a creationist here. So we were, you know, <laughs> oh, we're cutting that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, we respect all beliefs, except the ones we don't here on Iron Culture. And I think with that, uh, is there any, I want to open it up. I want to open it up. We, we've, we've gone over, all over the place. I think we've covered a really interesting history. We've got a lot of uh, experiences that, that you all have shared. Thank you. Um, and I want to just have open forum right now for anything if, that we may have neglected in this conversation, or maybe we just want to highlight. I have just some thoughts about the like evolution of performance for in women's sport. So I think early on and, and maybe like a lot of maybe post title nine women, a lot of women's sports were treated as kind of a sideshow, right? So it's like, we have to check this box. We have to have this this sport for women. And there was not much attention given to it. There was, you know, the top coaches weren't given to those, a lot of the teams, you know, women didn't have access to the same resources that men did. And I think what's been super cool to see in powerlifting since I started. So I would say I've, I've going on 10 years, um, is that women, um, are now at a point where they are quite literally almost as strong as the dudes that are like in their same weight category or pretty close. And just to show kind of just to like, like buck this mentality that women can't achieve what, what men can in strength. So I'm thinking even in like the untested world, like, um, Mariana Gasparian, I think has records that exceed the men's weight class that like is, I, I don't remember what she weighs. She's maybe like 60 something kilos and she out squats. I think the men's record in that same, in that like equivalent weight class, like things like that, that's, that's an enhanced lifter, but just so is the guy. Right. And, um, and, but even in the, in the drug tested in USA powerlifting in the IPF, we're seeing an absolute, like these records are like on the women's side are being demolished, like things that, we never saw possible for equipped, like single ply equipped women are now being exceeded by raw, you know, or dr raw te drug tested, drug free lifters. And I think it's pretty wild to think about what the next 10 years might look like in, in powerlifting, in drug tested powerlifting in the IPF because of like what we've seen. I mean, I'm, I'm talking like the last three or four years. That's kind of, that's what's happened. So imagine 10 years from now. I can't. It's just going to destroy my worldview too much, Natalie. I can't deal with it. <laughs> Women strong? Nope. Not going to imagine it. You're messing me up here. We need to do this crisis on tour. The edge. ASAP. <laughs> ASAP. Omar. No, I totally agree. I th I, I'm, I'm always astonished and blown away just by how much sh the strength standards have changed across the board, but especially uh, on, on the women's side. Uh, in, in the Iron Game and, and just the time we've been around, Omar, and, uh, and the time you've been around, uh, Natalie, since you've mentioned the last 10 years. So so for sure, I think it's going to be a, a really interesting uh, journey towards towards expanding our idea of what human limits are, which is neat. So can I ask a potentially nerdy question? Um, mm -hmm. Because I'm a historian, I'm really interested in lineages. So 
Pudgy Stockton is, you know, this American weightlifter from the 1940s. She has her barbells column and health, strength and health. We have like multiple lifters, bodybuilders and weightlifters from the 1980s who cite Pudgy Stockton as a role model. So Jan Todd, um, Catherine Marshall, um, Doris Barrio, all of these like great kind of pioneering female athletes, you know, citing Pudgy. I'm wondering, I don't think there's enough made about, say, the predecessors in women's strength sports. It seems a very, like as an outsider, it seems like a very present um, day issue. And there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. But I'm just wondering, like, as people really immersed in it, do you look at these historical examples or or do you not? Because if you don't, that's maybe a good thing because there's so many, you know, wonderful role models or examples or people you could look to for inspiration. Whereas in the 70s and 80s, you know, people had to go back like four decades to be like, that is the strong woman that shall inspire me. Um, so again, really nerdy question, but I'm just interested in terms of like, say, when you're starting out role models or inspiration I'm sure I speak for Eric and Omar and I say we probably all looked at pumping iron montages uh, at some point. So, you know, for, I think yeah. for men, that historical presence. Five minutes ago before this podcast started, that's just how I get my day going. <laughs> yeah, Connor, I did. Um, so I was brought up kind of in a, like, in a, a community of powerlifting that really focused on the history. And so I was really familiar with Jan Todd. I trained and cut my teeth with Priscilla Ribic, um for my first, you know, five, six years of training. And so that, yeah, so like very much I've, I've like been pretty well versed in the history, which has been cool. So. I'm not as well versed in the history, but there were a few people that I always, um, uh, Beb Francis was one for me, uh, because she, uh, she was also a thrower, which is my background from track and field. So I just thought that the weights she was picking up were insane. Um, and I saw that she had the same background as me. So that motivated me as well. Kimberly Walford's honestly, now we're competitors now, but the very first time I ever saw her deadlift, I thought it was so badass. That's a present day thing, but I guess she's kind of, she's a, she's an OG cause she's won IPF world championships seven, seven times now. Um, Sweden where I actually got silver to her was her seventh. Yeah, so she's been around for a long time, but she has a track and field background as well. So I just thought it was so badass seeing her deadlift, I think 540 pounds. That's the first time I ever saw a woman deadlift that much. And I thought that was insane and awesome. I met Kimberly Walford. A, I think that's awesome. And I love those. I, I, I just, interesting, fun story about Kimberly Walford, just how much of a athlete she is. Uh, I met her in 2013 when I did the Commonwealth Oceania Champs, and she was a guest lifter, as was Mike T. Good good day for me. And I introduced myself, said I'm a big fan, gave her some respect. And she's like, cool, maybe I'll see you at one of these worlds one of these days. And I was like, well, I mean, I'm not quite at the point where I'm qualifying. She's like, oh, you'll get there. And then she, and she, and she you know, went, on, went about her business, and I went... I don't think she has a perspective of how strong she is compared to me. <laughs> Keep so trying, I, little for the guy, record, I have, I have not yet qualified for worlds and, uh, you know, may, maybe Kim's right. Maybe I'm just, just gotta keep, keep giving the gold crack. Keep, yeah. keep, keep that dream alive. <laughs> Hell yeah. Right. I, I'm just picturing that mean Joe ad, you know, from the eighties where he's like, Hey kid, catch. And was he throw like the sweat tail? That's this big, you know, important moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 100 percent. one thing i uh just want to say quickly eric because i open up with a joke about the stronger by science uh podcast is actually greg to give a shout out to greg has put out a lot of fantastic resources dispelling a lot of the common myths that might be surrounding uh women in training and i think what is cool about powerlifting in general it being objective in nature is that a lot of those once again common myths or stereotypes are being absolutely shattered and you see that the amount of entrance inside uh, the lifting community, the, pre uh, the prevalence of it, and just the overall accomplishments are helping to really shift uh, the tide. And I think individuals like Greg and, and others who have contributed, and you're uh, you know, extremely well-versed, uh, Eric, when it comes to the literature, has helped from the scientific side because there'll be some archaic arguments. Well, you, can, like, you can't build muscles. And actually, proportionally, it's the same thing. So it's like, uh, 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 nah, I'm sorry. Ah, uh, Google failed you, my dude. I'm sorry. That that Google PhD, 
they didn't come through. So there, there are, uh, I would say, individuals on multiple fronts that are making that concerted effort. And by working together, you can see the real consequences in a positive sense. And check back on our earlier episode when we had <laughs> yeah. Sohee Lee and Greg Knuckles on to discuss the sex differences in strength training and nutrition. Oh, yeah. That's a great voice. Seamless. Yeah. Awesome. Well, folks, geez, it's been a fun time chatting with y'all, and I really appreciate you all coming on, uh, your valuable perspectives. I know I've learned some things. It's made me think. Uh, Connor, I appreciate your historical perspective, and you are always on point. We might even have you on a fourth time, but 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 no more than that, unless we do. Um, and uh, Natalie, congratulations on your three-peat. I know this is probably the, your first major accomplishment uh, just in just in general, uh, I think. And uh, Jess, don't worry, you'll get there one day too. Um, so now that we've established what all of your main priorities should be and how you value yourselves as humans and in life, uh, I'm just going to pass it over to Omar without any chance for them to correct me that that's their <laughs> most important uh, accomplishment to carry us out into the sunset. So we indeed have the final word. I would just say, Eric, what you said previously about that uh, ruthless uh, uh, capitalist message is poignant and you know we lost our sponsors so the good news is we kept our soul the bad news is we definitely lost our sponsors uh but i will say is wasn't it funny uh back when classical economists would put forth they would uh, posit that individuals in general would make rational choices in their best interest and that really didn't seem to pan out that one so i don't know are we are we uh 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 anti-capitalist or are we just spreading the good word i want to thank every single person for listening to this episode go ahead leave that comment do your thing that troll that's you know that just wants to pop off after the third minute it's like, ah! it's like we feel you and we're also here for you we'll also link everyone in the social media uh down below their social media down below if you want to follow if you want to keep engaging if you're listening by audio, you could go ahead and leave that comment on the YouTube section. We probably won't read it, but maybe we will. And if you want to leave a rating and review, we don't like to influence your choice, but there's clearly a right number. It's the most common number that people leave a rating out of five. Um, so go ahead, group think or be an individual, do your thing. And last but not least, we're back every single Monday from now until we take over that Galactic Federation over there. So we'll see you in the next episode.